Hello and welcome to the second of five sessions about vitality. Today we'll be talking about sexual vitality, which is certainly important for strong feelings of aliveness and zest in our human bodies and our human lives. Last time we talked about flow, and I framed it in a way to make it clear how it depends on these two complementary qualities of containment and openness. The metaphor that I used was of a hydroelectric plant that needs to contain water behind the dam in a reservoir in order to work, but it also needs to have an open channel for flow to leave the reservoir, to take the water out of the reservoir and let it turn turbines and generate electricity. So containment and openness are the complementary aspects that permit flow. Since we're talking about sexual vitality in this session, we're clearly going to be talking about how two people interact in an intimate relationship. It goes a lot further than that, but that needs to be part of our topic. And in intimate relationships, there is a need for both containment and openness. It's also important that they be relatively in balance. So if a couple is so contained that they turn to one another for all of their emotional and social and other needs, that's an arrangement that can work in the early infatuated stages, but is likely to feel claustrophobic and unsatisfying later on. Similarly, if the relationship is so open that the couples are effectively leading separate lives and not devoting any time or energy to nurturing their own unique bond with one another, that too is likely to feel unsatisfying. So there needs to be a kind of balance between the two. And in actual fact, there is going to be a kind of swinging or pendulation. At, so there will be times of a little more containment when the couple keeps to themselves and other times of a little more openness where they act more independently. With this kind of balance and a little bit of fluctuation, a creative loving bond is formed. At least this has been my experience and my observation. Clearly intimate partnerships come in all shapes, shapes and sizes. So there are couplings that do not involve a male and female human body. However, from the standpoint of biology and evolution, it's the coupling that leads to reproduction that matters most. And so to look at this from a biological perspective, we need to focus on the canonical intimate relationship, which is that between a young man and woman of childbearing age. So here we're seeing such a couple in Nepal having their wedding ceremony, and there is a feeling of solemnity and no doubt also joy in this occasion. The people who are companioning this couple as they form their wedding bond may not be thinking explicitly, but everybody knows that eventually the two couples, the two people will be coupling together, uh, having intercourse. And in a traditional society in particular, the expectation is that that intercourse will lead to a pregnancy. So soon enough, the male semen will be in the woman's vagina and the little sperm cells, the spermatozoa, will be making their way toward the cervical orifice and beyond. So they swim very vigorously up through the cervix into the uterus and up the uterus and through the fallopian tubes and eventually they come into range of the ovum, which is waiting, and then there's a kind of mad scramble as they compete with one another so that one and only one sperm ends up actually fertilizing this egg. It then begins to divide and it forms a little cluster of cells that makes its way back down into the uterus where it implants. And after implantation, it undergoes a very remarkable sequence of developmental uh, formation that leads in time to a human infant, that leads, in other words, to these little characters. And this is, from a biological standpoint, the whole reason for sexuality and also, to a certain extent, you know, the whole reason for a lot of what happens in a lifetime. 
From a human perspective, of course, there's more involved, but biologically, this is really the central key. So there's this incredible vital energy that is generated by this relationship between male bodies and female ones. And this isn't just in human experience, it's in all life forms that reproduce this way. So here we're seeing the sexual organs of a sea biscuit, which is related to a sea urchin and starfish and so on. And when we put the film in motion, what we see is this tremendous exuberant outpouring of sperm on the one hand, on the male side, and eggs on the other. To me, these videos really capture the power of life and its incredible zest for reproduction. And I think we can feel this zest in our bodies if we pay attention. And it's the same zest that motivates, or let's say enables, a seedling to gain a foothold in very inhospitable conditions and make a go of living, and eventually, presumably, reproducing. This is what life is all about. This power, this movement toward growth and reproduction. And this is why sexual vitality is such an important issue if we're looking to develop greater senses of aliveness and zest in our lives. Last time, I drew a relationship between chi and sexual vitality. My thinking is that the chi, this felt energy that we can feel in our bodies, is related to the larger scale feeling of zest for life. I used that hydroelectric plant analogy to build that out, beginning with this more simple version of the water wheel. So in this metaphor, the chi is like the water, and it turns the wheel that generates the vitality, so to speak. So it's the movement of the chi, the flow of the chi, that creates this quality that we know as you know, aliveness and includes sexual vitality. Something that might have uh, been discussed but wasn't is the origin of the qi. You know, where does it come from? In Chinese medicine, there's a lot that's uh, written about that, and it includes things like coming from the foods we eat and so on. But I want to take this in more general terms. So let's ask a related question according to this metaphor. Let's say, where does the water come from? Well, you know, the initial answer might be, well, it comes from the sky, you know, in rain. And where does the rain come from? Well, it comes from clouds. And where do the clouds come from? Well, they come from evaporation in the ocean. And how did oceans uh, come into being? Well, you know, the, the story can go back and back and back. And before long, we're going to be all the way back to the Big Bang. And we still won't have really answered the question because we actually don't know where the Big Bang came from. You know, there are some theories about that, but we don't know for sure. So there's never going to be a final answer, or at least so far we don't have one, as to, you know, where all this comes from. The important point, I think, for people that want to live with a sense of, you know, satisfaction and joy is that, in fact, there is a lot that's moving in life that gives it power, that gives it zest, that gives it vitality. Well, there's another question we could ask, not where did all this come from, but where is it going? Particularly, where is it going in our lives? After all, as humans, we don't devote all that much energy to having sex. I mean, even when we're young, we're probably only having sex a fairly small fraction of our 24-hour days. And as we get older, that you know, drops off even more. So we have this whole lifetime, most of it not devoted to sex. Now, granted, some of it's devoted for some people to raising children, but that wasn't true in my case, and it's not true in everyone's case. And even so, you know, child rearing you know, mostly takes energy in the first you know, few years, and, and that energy tapers off. And by the time the child leaves home at age 18 or something, you know, there's still a lot of work going on in terms of child rearing, but people have lots of other things going on in their lives. They have work lives and social lives and artistic or creative or hobby lives and so on. There's a lot that happens in life, in human life, that really has nothing to do with reproducing new humans. So where does all that energy go? That's the question. And this brings up the topic of sublimation, the idea that sexual energies can be repurposed or diverted to other needs and other motives. So for instance, we can have you know, cultural artifacts like this very impressive 5,000-year-old 
complex that we call Stonehenge. And in a certain sense, we can see here the kind of raw energy, very close to what we would call sexual energy, that is going into this. You know, how do we see that? Well, for one thing, there are these vertical elements, these enormous stones that were propped up, you know, often carried a considerable distance and then stood on end in such a way that they've stayed in place for thousands of years. You know, a lot of effort went into establishing these vertical, essentially phallic edifices. And in addition to that, there's a circular motif going on, one we could say, you know, that looks a bit more feminine in its design, right? So there's both the phallic verticality and the more feminine sort of orifice, right, to speak plainly here. So let's look at these and, you know, get a sense as to how they interrelate and interact. So in our modern cultural artifacts, we continue to see these sorts of complementary elements. So cities these days are mostly made up, you know, the downtown areas of, you know, tall vertical uh, skyscrapers that have this, you know, characteristic of being rather phallic in shape, you know, having that, we could say, contained sort of masculine energy. After all, these are buildings that bring lots of people together. Uh, so there is this quality of containment and ascent. It's a, a building that's going up in the sky, and it does, again, you know, have an obvious sort of phallic appearance to it. And then we look at this cook pot over on the right, this large, uh, rather nutritious-looking, tasty soup or stew being prepared, presumably for a you know, big group of hungry and grateful people. And here we've got the quality of openness in play. You know, this is a generous act, this creating, this cooking and serving people a meal. All of that, uh, you know, sort of energy of a very different sort than the kind that goes into a skyscraper. Now, I've been kind of pointing to the relationship between these geometric shapes and the shape of human reproductive organs. And clearly the verticality has the shape of a male organ and the circularity is much more feminine in its appearance. And we could continue to use that terminology, you know, male and female, but it's probably more productive to switch terms and start talking about yin and yang. We've all seen this symbol and most of us, I think, know that in Chinese philosophy, yin refers to energies that are feminine, they're cool, they tend to be related to shadow rather than bright light, they're descending, they're moist. And the list actually goes on, but that's kind of the basic. And then on the yang side, it's ascending and it's bright and it tends to be dry and active and masculine. And the idea is that these two are in a constant conversation and they're flowing from one to the next all the time. And that right at the center of the most yang region, there's a little dot of yin. And right at the center of the most yin region, there's a little dot of yang. And so the two are never completely separate. They cannot be completely divided. And vitality comes when they're in balance. And the idea isn't that one is better than the other, you know, the issue is, are they properly flowing one to the next, and are they approximately balanced? When they are, then we feel vital as a species and as individuals. So in the wild, the same kind of dynamic comes into play. So here we see a coyote, presumably chasing down some prey, very active, very young, running, heated, you know, outgoing. And then at some other time, the coyote must, of course, you know, settle down into a more yin state, a little bit cooled down, more restful, more retiring. Both of these are equally important. The coyote must catch food and it must recharge. So here we are in a culture that really applauds the yang aspect, you know, the going out and running the races and competing in the business sphere and, you know, acquiring things and building stuff, you know, we get a lot of rewards socially for all of our yang activities, and we get far fewer rewards for attending to our need for the more yin, the more retiring, the more feminine aspect of life, the settling in, the nesting, the resting. 
And yet it is just as important to health and in some sense more important. You know, animals in the wild, they do exert a lot of energy running down prey, you know, the coyote, the predators, but they spend a lot more time resting. And we might want to learn from that and perhaps change our priorities so that rest and nest is looked at as just as important and maybe more so than, you know, build and succeed and so on. So sexual vitality in a meditative sense is going to draw from both the yin and the yang, from both the retiring and the active. And this can be hard and confusing for us because we're so conditioned to look at activity and productivity as being good and rest as, you know, perhaps being necessary, but being something close to laziness or slacking. You know, this is the cultural message that uh, we hear and we may not personally buy into it completely but it affects us and leads to some confusion and difficulty as we try to balance our energies. Something else that can be confusing and difficult is sex itself. Many people have confusion, they have sexual trauma, they have uh, you know, gender questions, they are mistreated by the culture because of their you know, gender behavior, or they you know, feel like they're being you know, locked into a kind of role that doesn't really suit who they actually are, etc. You know, they may have uh, insecurity around you know, sexual intimacy or downright fear. Uh, they, you know, could have trouble achieving orgasm or have trouble achieving erection and on and on. There can be all this confusion around sex. We're very familiar with this. Now, of course, some people are, you know, pretty comfortable with sex and don't have all those issues, don't have all that conflict. And, and that's great, but many people do, and I don't want to leave that out. Well, the good news is, is that no matter where the conflict or the trouble or the resistance comes from, we can work with it by, you know, turning back to this quality of flow and allowing the difficulty and the joy and the pleasure and the discomfort and the embarrassment and the pride and the activity and the rest, all of this can come and go in our awareness and interweave and intermingle in a flowing, organic, and dynamic way, you know, provided that we learn to kind of encourage that flowing and that intermingling. And that's what this class uh, is hoping to establish in all of us, including myself, is greater ability to bring all of these opposing and complementary qualities into a dynamic and fruitful interplay that will generate for us sexual vitality. And really the more accurate way to say that is it will reconnect us with the sexual vitality that is already our birthright.